Alright guys, now I'm going to teach you how carbonyl compounds react, beginning with a short analogy. I want you to imagine a happy man who happens to be a stick figure standing in this kind of posture. Now if this man gets hit in the groin with a football at high speed, the product formed from that reaction will be this. Carbonyl compounds react in much the same way. If you can imagine a carbonyl compound, as shown here, being kind of like my stick figure man, you can see that this carbon represents his groin, and this R and Y groups are his legs, and this is his torso. You can imagine a football coming into his crotch, just as we showed before. Instead of a football, however, this is going to be a nucleophile, represented here by Z minus. When Z minus comes in to this carbon atom, however, it can react or respond a little bit differently from the way that the man responded when a football hit him. When he got hit by a football, there was only one response he could have, and that was to go down. When a carbonyl compound gets hit by a nucleophile Z minus, it can respond by having these pi electrons go up onto the oxygen. Thus, Z minus comes into this carbon, and these pi electrons go up onto this oxygen giving this tetrahedral intermediate where there's an O minus here. When this minus charge in the oxygen collapses back down to reform this double bond, closing like a trap door, it kicks off Y minus as a leaving group, giving this kind of product shown here. Now I have to warn you that Y minus will only get expelled if it's a better leaving group than Z minus. If Z minus is a better leaving group than Y minus, then when the minus charge on the oxygen comes da back down, it will actually kick off Z, reverting back to the starting material, instead of kicking off Y minus. Now in the case of aldehydes and ketones, Y here would be a hydrogen or an alkyl group. Hydrogen and alkyl group are very, very poor leaving groups, so the O minus cannot come down and kick off an H minus or a carbon with a minus charge on it, because that would be extremely unstable. Hence, for aldehydes and ketones, this minus charge does not come down to reform a double bond and give this kind of product. It does something a little bit different, which we will discuss later on in chapter 18. For all of the compounds covered in this chapter, however, we have to remember that the nucleophile comes right into the crotch of the carbonyl, kicks the pi electrons onto the oxygen, giving me this tetrahedral intermediate. Then the minus charge on the oxygen comes down, kicks off this leaving group Y, and gives me this kind of product. Now I offer you a word of warning and some counsel. The mechanisms in these reactions are extremely repetitive. In fact, from one reaction to the next, you'll see that the mechanisms are more or less identical with only minor variations. Now, if you gain the ability to see this pattern, to see the repetitive nature of these mechanisms, learning the material in this chapter will be easy. It will be as though you are only learning one or maybe just a few reactions instead of dozens. This mechanistic repetitiveness reminds me of a contemporary song that I was recently exposed to, which I found to be absolutely hilarious. It went something like this. <laughs> Barbara Streisand. And then that sequence was repeated about 900 times. You should begin to see as we cover this chapter that the mechanisms here are extremely repetitive. Thus, you don't have to feel like you're learning 900 different reactions. You're really only weren't learning just one reaction repeated about 900 different times, like the Barbara Streisand song, with only slight variations here and there. This chart rates leaving groups from best to worst. Because chloride is such a great leaving group, Acid chlorides are super reactive, and they're the most reactive in the series. NH2- minus is a very, very bad leaving group, and that's the reason why amides are the least reactive in this series. That's actually a good thing, since proteins are made up of large chains of amide bonds. If NH2 were a good leaving group, then every time we drank water, all of the proteins in our bodies would gradually dissolve as the nitrogen or amide bond was being 
displaced by the oxygen from the water. Fortunately, that does not occur, and I'm grateful for it. This slide summarizes all of the reactions featured in the first half of chapter 17. As you can see, what we'll learn is that you can start with a number of acid derivatives, and depending on what Y is, you can displace it with a hydroxide nucleophile to form a carboxylic acid, with an alcohol as a nucleophile to form an ester, with uh, an amine like ammonia or another amine as a nucleophile to form an amide, and then Grignard reactions, which we actually won't cover until later on. With that overview now given, we're going to look at every single one of these, one at a time. Here is an acid chloride, and as you can see, when acid chloride is reacted with a methoxide nucleophile, the methoxide group replaces the chlorine to form an ester. I've also written here that if you try to do the reverse, that is, have a chloride nucleophile come in and displace the methoxide, you get no reaction. I want you to think to yourselves, why in the world is there no reaction occurring in the second case? I'll answer that in two slides. But first, I want to address the mechanism for the first reaction. So here's my starting material. It's an acid chloride. How in the world is that Cl displaced? Well, my methoxide nucleophile comes into this carbonyl carbon. These electrons get thrust up onto that oxygen, and it generates this tetrahedral intermediate. The negative charge on the oxygen then comes down and closes here like a trap door to form a double bond here, pushing off the chloride as a leaving group. This then gives this intermediate, or this product, I should say, which is my methyl ester and chloride leaving group taking off. So I asked you earlier, why can't you do the reverse? That is, why can't I take a chloride and displace an OCH3 with it? This would be the mechanism of that reaction. If I started with my methyl ester and had my chloride nucleophile come into the carbonyl carbon, the electrons would then go up onto that oxygen, generating this tetrahedral intermediate. The O- then comes down, closes to form a double bond here, kicking off the OCH3. That would then give my theoretical acid chloride product. So I'm telling you that this reaction does not occur. Why doesn't it occur? Well, the reason is because this step is total crap. Why? Because a chloride is a better leaving group than an OCH3. Chlorine is better able to handle a negative charge. So when this negative charge comes down to close that and form a double bond, in reality it would not kick off an OCH3. It would kick off the chloride and go back to the starting material. Hence, this resolidifies the principle I taught a few slides ago. These kinds of reactions only occur when the nucleophile is not as good of a leaving group as the leaving group. If your leaving group here is actually a poorer leaving group than the nucleophile, then this reaction will not occur.